<laughs> um, let's see. Well, I am going to get started. So I would like to welcome everybody for spending their lunch hour with us. And um, today we're going to be having a phenomenal presentation and cultivating, cultivating well-being in the workplace. And um, well, for that, my name is Tanya Zavalegi. I'm part of the Corporate Engagement and Partnerships team at, here at the University of Irvine Division of Continuing Education. And we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. As you saw, this event is being recorded. You will be receiving a YouTube link presentation afterwards and a PDF of the presentation as well. Uh, let's see, there's closed captioning uh, available. You have to click at the bottom icon where you see CC and you'll get the, the kind of subtitles. For questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A and we'll be monitoring that. We have my colleague, Lindsay Doherty, behind the scenes who's gonna help us with that. Um, you don't have to hold your questions, go ahead and ask and we'll just kind of see how, how, how it goes. Um, we will do a cutoff um, at the end to have even more questions if you want that. And then now let's just go on to our speaker who's who, you, who you're here to see. And um, I wanted to present Jessica Drew to pause and that's not your name. It's, it's a different last name. So sorry. And, um, and then uh, she's the director of mindfulness services and clinical psychologist at the UCI Irvine Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute. She completed her undergraduate in psychology and the University of Santa Barbara and her doctorate in clinical psychology at California School of Professional Psychology with an emphasis on multicultural and community issues. With over 20 years of experience at the University of California, Jessica has served as a clinical psychologist, a lecturer and a diversity and corporate educator. And I've gotten to know her and she is a phenomenal human being a great presenter and running an amazing program. And now, off to you. <laughs> it's all oh. you. Go ahead and share the screen. Thank you for that kind introduction, Tanya, and thank you for having me here, and thank you all for being here. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about um, cultivating employee well-being, um, mindfulness in the workplace, and really kind of giving um, you know an overview of what mindfulness is and how we might even try it on, um, what the research is saying about it, and also talking about our upcoming uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction course. But before we get into all of that, I really kind of wanted to step back um, and put this in context of really what we have all been going through for the past um, few years. Um, as I'm sure you all know, these have been very tumultuous times, you know, starting with um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we also recently are, are a lot of, there's a lot of stressors around inflation. Um, we witnessed uh, George Floyd uh, be killed and there was um, so much happening around race relations as there always is, but um, even more than ever around that. Um, you know, we are living in a deeply divided country and um, all of this amidst a backdrop of, of climate change that's impacting all of us. Um, and now also the war on Ukraine um, is causing a lot of stress. So, um, you know, these are, um, I think stress has always been a part of our lives, but it certainly feels in the past couple of years that more than ever it has been. Um, and there's been a very significant mental health impact on people around the world. And um, I wanted to share some survey results. Um, this was a 2021 survey by APA called Stress in America. And you can see that mental health worsened amongst all of the generations, especially Gen Z, but all have been impacted. And concerns of the future were um, noted by people of all racial groups, um, but different levels of, you know, different levels of concern we can see here, but still, you know, 
practically half of the people responding that they have concerns about our future. Um, they also did a 2022 survey. Um, so you can see um, here are some of the major stressors being inflation, supply chain issues, global uncertainty, potential retaliation from Russia, and the invasion of Ukraine. So um, very high levels of stress around all of these issues. And then they even have a whole separate graph on just the war in Ukraine and how that's compounding fear and anxiety, um, including the fact that 87% of the people indicated that it feels like there has been a constant stream of crises without a break over the last two years. So really like cumulative impact. Um, and um, I'll let you just kind of glance down at many of the concerns related to the war in Ukraine. And again, noting how high um, of numbers that these are. Um, the survey also demonstrated um, strained relationships that people are experiencing. Um, so 58% reporting a relationship strain or end as a result of um, the following conflicts, like related to the pandemic, whether around canceling events or gatherings, vaccine, mask wearing, all of these things creating a lot of differences and, and conflict. And really um, even looking at impact on life in general. So 63% of the respondents indicated that their life is forever changed by the pandemic. Um, 63% also indicating that the past two years are a blur and 66% that with each new variant, they lose hope that the pandemic will ever end. And all of this also has had an impact on, you know, um, our individual kind of our health, um, our, you know, what, what we're doing around, we see a lot of um, weight changes, a lot more drinking alcohol for people. And I think that really, you know, this is sort of our, a tendency when, when we're suffering in general, when we're faced with these kinds of stressors, maybe to, um, there's a tendency to turn away, I think, to distract oneself, to perhaps even self-medicate in ways. So through food, through alcohol, even through our gadgets, right? When, when there's something uncomfortable, we always have something we can turn to that might serve us in the short run, um, but perhaps not in the long run to be engaging in these behaviors as a way of kind of numbing from the pain. Um, I wanted to share a bit more um, also, the APA did a work and well being survey. And so, kind of moving to how is this playing out in the workplace? Um, so, more than two in five people indicated that they intend to change jobs up from one in three in 2019. Um, and typically, those who feel stressed during the workday, which is 71%, are more than three times as likely to say they intend to seek employment elsewhere. And more on work and well being, you can see um, this is who's indicating that they intend to seek employment outside of their company um, in the next year. Um, so you can see a breakdown by race with Hispanic adults um, and Black adults being higher than, much higher than white adults, um, um, LGBTQ employees higher, people with disabilities higher, those who have experienced or witnessed discrimination in their workplace higher. And then um, Mental Health America also did a Mind the Workplace survey. And you can see some of these items that they looked at. And they, they also had a way of kind of indicating who they considered healthy workplaces versus unhealthy. Um, and you can see that there's a big difference in these survey items when there's an a healthy workplace versus an unhealthy. So whether people spent actively are spending time looking for a new position or having difficulty concentrating at work, stress in relationships, um, and that has led also to other mental health concerns. In unhealthy workplaces, th these are significantly higher. And um, 
the World Health Organization in March had a news release um, saying that the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a 25% increase in anxiety and depression worldwide. And really have said this as a wake up call to all countries to step up our mental health services. So um, these have truly been dark times. But as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, only in the darkness can you see the stars. And, you know, I'm sure we've all been asking ourselves where, you know, where is the light for us in these dark times? And, um, you know, for me, um, with my job as a, uh, director of mindfulness programs, as well as being a clinical psychologist, those are two places that I find light in. Um, when I was looking at the treatment of mental health on the CDC website, their recommendations, um, I found that in addition to psychotherapy when indicated, the following evidence-based preventative practices are recommended. Um, and you know, we all know this, healthy eating, right? Physical activity, getting the recommended amount of sleep. These are all very important. I was actually pleasantly surprised to find mindfulness on their list of recommendations. Um, and you know, I, I think these are evidence-based practices and there is now a growing body of evidence around mindfulness that it helps with our mental health. Um, amongst many other things. And so really I have these two stars because for me, you know, psychotherapy and mindfulness are just such areas of passion. Um, and, you know, I think that both of these practices are kind of the opposite of turning away and distracting ourselves from our pain. And not to say I haven't done that as well myself because I certainly can engage in those practices. But I think that when we turn inward and more um, introspective practices, um, which also um, maybe ironically are also, I think, very connective practices, connecting to ourselves, but also to someone else. I mean, in psychotherapy, you know, it is really sitting with someone bearing witness to our pain. And I believe it is through that relationship that change comes about. Um, and mindfulness, um, also, while it can be going inward, um, in my own practice, I have felt like it has provided such a connection also to others and to what's happening in our world. So it's really connecting to myself and to others. Um, so, you know, traditionally in the workplace, um, many psychotherapy programs are provided through the employee assistance uh, programs. And um, I think uh, also, you know, I want to kind of make a case for mindfulness being um, a huge support um, that can be brought into workplace settings um, or personal settings. But like, I think um, infusing it more into the workplace can really uh, create a culture of well-being for people. And, you know, something um, I just thought I'd mention, uh, also a part of my background, um, in addition to being in the UC system for over 20 years, I actually taught um, mindfulness for 10 years um, at Annalise Schools in Laguna Beach to um, preschoolers through uh, sixth graders. Um, taught them uh, throughout the year, um, weekly lessons, and you know, really with the goal of creating a culture of well-being and giving these tools at a very young age that they can carry throughout their lives. Um, and just a little side note, actually, um, um, APA um, grants one school in the nation a year the Golden Psy Award for integrating psychological best practices throughout their curriculum. And Annalise Schools got that in 2018 for many, many, many reasons. They're like just a, a phenomenal place, um, but we were really proud of that award. Um, and so, you know, mindfulness really is a very ancient practice, practiced uh, for thousands of years around the world, associated with many different cultures and religions. Um, it really started to, I think, um, gain more support in the United States, um, beginning in the 1970s. And um, you may have heard of John Kabat-Zinn, um, who 
was actually at that time at MIT studying molecular biology. And outside of his studies, he was meditating um, and found this to be very helpful. Um, and then when he graduated, he got a job at University of Massachusetts Medical School. He continued to meditate and really felt like those in his life who were the most resilient to the stressors of life were actually those in um, like his meditation uh, circle, um, even more so than uh, the doctors and nurses that he was working with at the hospital. And um, he really felt a calling to bring mindfulness um, to uh, the general population. And so he um, developed an eight week class um, called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction or MBSR that teaches people how to pay attention in a new way. Um, and he asked all the doctors at the hospital to send him their patients that were in chronic pain and that they felt nothing else could help them. No more, there's kind of, they'd had all the medicine they could have or were at the highest doses. They'd had all the surgery they could have and sort of those patients, the that the doctors had run out of hope for, John Cabot then said, send, those, send them to me. And he taught them MBSR and um, many reported feeling much better, dropping their medications um, or reducing, reducing their medications. And um, this really was the beginning of the research um, where we now started to have an evidence base around these interventions and how they truly impact people. And um, you know now mindfulness is being, it's still in its infancy in terms of the research, but it's now um, becoming one of the most uh, well-studied topics in medicine and psychology. Um, and they're looking at how it affects so many different areas of, of people's lives. And so what is mindfulness? <laughs> well, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. But what exactly should we be paying attention to? Well, we can pay attention to many things, to our thoughts, our body, our behavior, our emotions, and even to cultivating a heart-centered existence. So let's begin with our thoughts. So I love this image of mindfulness. I don't know who the artist is or I would give them credit, <laughs> but um, you know, I feel like we have two people in the exact same environment. They're both walking toward four trees and a sun, right? And the one on the left, um, their mind is filled with so many different thoughts right? Perhaps like their to-do list, maybe thoughts about, you know, the pandemic, who knows? Um, but clearly there's a lot going on in their mind um, and they're really missing this place that they're in while the person on the right is perceiving four trees and a sun, probably feeling the warmth of the sun on their skin, maybe hearing the birds chirp, really showing up for that moment of their life. And so um, we've got, you know, the one on the left has their mind full and the one on the right is mindful. And something I ask myself frequently is, are my thoughts serving me? Because we need to think, <laughs> we certainly need to think about the past and the future and, and the pandemic and all of the things on my first slide of the tumultuous times we've been in, we need to think about these things, you know, but sometimes we are maybe thinking about these things so much that they're not, our thoughts aren't serving us anymore. When I ask myself this question, usually my answer is no. Usually I realize several times throughout the day, even now, that my thoughts, I, I don't mean now in this moment, but just even now that even now that my job is all centered around mindfulness, it's still, it's a, it's really a, a practice of being aware of, you know, where are our thoughts going and, and um, noticing when they're not serving us. And before I learned mindfulness, I would just follow my thought train 
whatever train came across the station, I would jump on it and go with it until the, you know, in, until the ride was over. And then I'd get on the next thought train. But with mindfulness, I think we can realize, do I even want to be on this train? <laughs> and if the answer is no, it's really through the techniques of mindfulness that we can bring ourselves back and ground ourselves into the present moment, right? It doesn't mean being without thoughts. It's just having a way to come back to the moment. And um, some of my favorite research is actually happening at Harvard, or um, this was a while ago. They did a study. They had a hypothesis that our wandering minds uh, were impacting our happiness. And so they created a, an app called Track Your Happiness. And they asked, um, and they did research and thousands of people enrolled from around the world. They had a very, very diverse group of people in this study and a very large group. And they would ping them at various times of the day and ask three questions. First, how do you feel right now? So from very bad to very good. The next, you know, what are you doing? You know, what is your task at hand right now? People would answer. Um, and then are you thinking about something other than what you're currently doing? So if the answer was no, they're saying, you know, my mind is on my task at hand. But if yes, they had a follow-up question. And that is, did your mind wander to someplace unpleasant, pleasant, or neutral? And so what they found is that, um, the people in the study, their minds were wandering nearly 48% of the time, right? So almost half of their lives, they were not showing up for their actual life in that moment. They were someplace else, um, which is a pretty significant amount of time. Um, and then they looked at, well, how is this impacting their happiness? And you know, a lot of people, their minds are going to unpleasant thoughts, which as you might imagine, would have had significantly lower rates of happiness than if they were in the present moment. But to me, some of the most interesting part of this research is that even when their minds went to pleasant places, their happiness in general was lower than when their mind was in the present moment. Even if what was happening in the present moment was a boring task, like driving in traffic or doing household chores, that people still rated their levels of happiness higher when they were focused on their actual task at hand than if their mind was wandering away to planning a trip to Hawaii or something. And uh, there's a TED talk on this. Um, Matt Killingsworth, one of the researchers says, if mind wandering were a slot machine, we would never want to play in terms of our happiness because where we're going is not making us happier than being right here. So what else can we pay attention to? Well, we can pay attention to our body. And there's a lot going on in our body all the time, um, including, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with the stress response, the fight or flight, um, where you know when we are presented with a threat, we need to react. Um, so if a car is careening towards you, right, your um, the amygdala um, is going to react and uh, to that threat and have a cascade effect uh, in your whole body, you know, stimulating the hypothalamus, which activates the sympathetic nervous system, releasing adrenaline, and then, um, you know, secreting uh, cortisol for continued alertness. So this is happening very quickly in our body, you know, and our pupils dilate, we breathe fast, right? We uh, muscles tense, all so that we can get ready to react to that threat. Are we going to fight the threat or are we gonna flee? Um, and, you know, this is like a part of our survival, um, but <laughs> I think it also causes us great suffering that we um, sometimes can really put ourselves into fight or flight when there's not um, a stressor that when, when we are safe in that moment, but we're thinking of a stressor, we can still end up in these, this space of um, all of these things happening in our bodies. Um, Robert Sapolsky is a professor at Stanford who wrote the book, um, Why Don't Zebras Get Ulcers? And he actually like takes students in his lab to Africa 
in the savanna to study wild animals and like their stress response and like study the zebra being chased by the lion and what's happening. Like us, of course, they're in fight or flight, right? But the difference is actually when the zebra, when the threat is over and the zebra has escaped, the zebra can quickly go back to grazing in the savanna because they're not holding on to those thoughts that are still creating fight or flight. But we as human beings often hang on to the stressor and continue to play it out or think about all the what ifs and continue to play that out and send our bodies into fight or flight chronically, even when we don't need to be in that space, when it's not helping us to survive, it's actually hurting us. But a wonderful thing about our bodies is that they can also counter stress. Our bodies can counter stress. And you know, one of the gateways into the present moment is actually through our senses. Um, and so I invite you, if you would like to try on a little mindfulness exercise with me right now, you know, our bodies are all here, right? But our minds can be anywhere. So you might wanna notice where your mind is. Um, and then we can really uh, begin uh, by tuning into our sense of sight. So, you know, you might start by looking at the um, image on the screen. Um, but then I invite you to really turn away from the screen and look at the space that you're in right now. Just noticing your surroundings as if for the very first time. And remember, part of the definition of mindfulness is to do so non-judgmentally. So if you're looking around thinking like, oh, I really need to clean that up or change that, you know, notice that there's judgment and see if you can just move into a place of just perceiving things as they are. So noticing perhaps maybe there's other people in the room or furniture, maybe you're outside. Uh, noticing colors and shapes and lighting, just taking in your surroundings. And now if you like, um, taking your gaze downward or closing your eyes and shifting your attention to your sense of hearing. So noticing the sounds around you, you might notice sounds far away. You might notice sounds nearby. Maybe even within your own body. And now bringing your attention to your body. So feeling yourself wherever you are, if you're sitting in a chair, you might notice the points of contact with your chair. You might notice your feet on the floor, the air on your skin. So just noticing any sensations in your body. And now shifting to your breath. So noticing the sensations in your nose or your mouth, maybe your chest or your belly, wherever you feel your breath most prominently. And seeing if you can stay with a curiosity around noticing the sensations of the in-breath and the out-breath maybe even the pause in between. And if your thoughts are going to other topics, just noticing that they did and gently guiding them back to your breath. And noticing how you feel. And when you're ready, opening your eyes and bringing your attention back to the presentation, to the screen. And, um, you know, when people participate in these classes or practice mindfulness, there's often a range of reaction to doing a meditation. 
I mean, for some people and or, you know, there, there can be a sense of relaxation, a sense of calm um, for others or, or even for the same person, depending, they can sometimes have it be relaxing, other times it can be a struggle, but even that struggle is a part of the practice if we are if we find it difficult to be in the moment, if we find our thoughts pulling us away, that actually is the practice of mindfulness. It's not having a blank mind. It's learning to notice when our mind leaves and then gently bringing it back, even if it means doing so 100 times in one meditation. <laughs> so we can also be mindful of our behavior. And, um, I saw some research a while ago on um, multitasking, and um, I thought it was really interesting. You know, I think we live in a society that really um, kind of promotes multitasking, and we feel like we there's so much to do, and we're all trying to do so many things at once. But what the research found is that we really don't multitask. We we can't do that very well. Computers can, but people our brains actually really are made to focus on one thing at a time. And so in this study, they had people, you know, doing, they were giving people more than one task to do and found them that when they did, they did those tasks less well than if they just did one task at a time. And another thing they noticed is that often when people were multitasking, they were more exhausted. And so something I've really been working on is monotasking when possible. <laughs> and, you know, just really trying to do one thing at a time. And um, I mean, that can range from whether it be doing something, you know, at work. It could even be when I'm in a conversation with someone, right? I'm sure we've all been in conversations with people and we know that they're focused on other things, like maybe their phone. <laughs> and we know how that feels on the receiving end. And so what does it mean to fully show up in a relationship with someone else in a, com in a conversation to truly be there with them in that moment? And it can change everything. And really, you know, any activity that we do, we can either be checked out or we can bring our full attention to it. I mean, you know, think about pre-pandemic, I think the way most people wash their hands was just very quickly, a lot of times, this task we know we have to do, let's wash our hands, but our mind is probably on our next thing that we have to get to and off we run. Um, but, you know, we can wash our hands mindfully and it's not just adding time by, you know, as they tell the kids like singing uh, happy birthday or the ABCs while we're washing, right? It's actually, you know, we can um, do this by, you know, stepping up and we can even, I, when I taught the kids, we would pretend that there was a sink in front of us. And we also taught this to nurses at UCI Medical Center. With, we did research on safety in the workplace. And we taught them um, in BSR class, but we also added in this meditation of mindful hand washing. And so you can, um, you know, maybe pretend like you're walking up to the sink you use most often and, you know, feel your feet on the floor and know your intention, right, is to get germs off. And so then you can kind of turn the water on and put your hands underneath and notice um, the temperature of the water and how it feels washing over your hands. And then, you know, putting soap on and getting a lather. And then the kids tell me to, you know, remember to turn the water back off while we're doing this so we can save water. <laughs> and then um, I asked them like, okay, let's start washing our hands. And they'd start by doing the palms, but we'd say, okay, well, if you are trying to get germs, if that's your intention, what, how do you wash differently? Well, that's when they start going in between the fingers or the back of the hands, maybe under our nails, right, our wrists. Um, and while we're doing this, we can also do this with heartfulness and we can really, you know, say something to ourselves, like I am taking care of myself and I'm taking care of my community, right? And then, feeling the water wash away and the soap suds wash away and drying our hands, uh, maybe smelling the nice clean scent at the end. These are ways that we can really bring ourselves into the moment and all of a sudden hand washing be can become a meditation that we're doing in the midst of our day, right? As can any other activity. Okay, so we can also be mindful of our emotions. and. Um, 
So one of the things, you know, I think I mentioned earlier the way in which sometimes there's discomfort or suffering and we might choose to distract ourselves. Well, um, the study at UCLA found that when we label our emotions, when we say what emotion is here, it actually disrupts the amygdala. Remember the part of our brain that kind of kicks off the fight or flight response? Well, we can disrupt that by actually showing up for our, our emotions and like noting what emotion is there, right? So I'm feeling um, anger, you know, I'm feeling sadness, you know, I'm feeling grief, right? Being there for it instead of distracting ourselves, showing up for it. And in mindfulness classes, there's a lot of poetry that is often brought in and um, you know, one of my favorite poems, perhaps you've heard this one, is by Rumi called The Guest House. So this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So we can also be paying attention to cultivating a heart-centered existence. And a, a you know, big movement within the field of mindfulness has really been around self-compassion. And um, two researchers, uh, Kristen Neff and Chris Germer, two psychologists, um, have really been studying the mammalian caregiving system and how mammals care for their young. And, um, you know, a lot of that is through touch and vocalizations. And yet we often haven't been taught how to bring these to ourselves. I mean, if we think about the way I think so many people speak to themselves, our inner voice, we're speaking to ourselves throughout every day, right? What, how do we speak to ourselves when we are having a hard time or suffering? I mean, a lot of times we're really beating ourselves up. And um, yet, if a dear friend were suffering in the same way, you know, we would never say those words to them. And so um, there's really practices around self-compassion and speaking to ourselves in a new voice um, that can be very, very powerful. And also bringing gentle touch to ourselves. So by just, you know, placing a hand on ourselves, um, the research is finding that this can lower our cortisol levels. So there's so much um, that we can learn from these practices. So when we pay attention to our thoughts and our body and our behavior, our emotions and cultivating a heart-centered existence, we are utilizing evidence-based practices to um, support our well-being. And all that we need to do is pay attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And I wanted to just um, end with a few more slides, kind of more around the workplace and our upcoming program, but kind of returning to mental health in America and their mind the workplace survey and the employer responsibility to employee mental health. As you can see, you know, these survey items like my company's leadership speaks openly about mental health. Um, they're invested in their employees' well being. They, um, they're invested in developing supportive managers, care about my personal well being. They provide access to mental health training and they invest in an inclusive environment where employees of all identities feel valued and represented. These are you know, you can see the healthy workplaces are doing these things, right? When we are really, you know, making like, how do we cultivate well-being 
when, when we companies that care about this are, are considered healthy companies. Um, many years ago, Aetna did some research on um, offering mindfulness and yoga to their employees. And you can see that they had like a 28% reduction in stress levels. This was pre-pandemic, several years before the pandemic. Um, a 20% improvement in sleep quality, 19% drop in gain. And then they also talk about gains in productivity. And I thought I'd share a little bit about what we've been doing at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute since the pandemic began. Um, one of the things that we started to do was provide virtual services to UCI employees for starters. We have 25,000 employees. And so we offered integrative health services, including mindful meditation, yoga for well-being, health nutrition, guided acupressure, biofeedback. Um, and um, we got such great feedback on it and, and recognition around this that actually UC Office of the President called and asked if we could provide these services um, throughout the, to employees throughout the entire UC system, um, those who had UC care insurance and their families. So it was an additional kind of 45,000 people that we've been providing these services to. And um, as mentioned, some of them are, some of the services are the mindful meditation and the yoga for well-being that I oversee. And um, we decided actually to make these particular services free to the whole community. And um, so when Tanya sends a follow-up email to all of you, it will include a flyer to our, we do meditations Monday through Friday, um, 25 minute meditations at live streams. And we also do yoga for well-being classes, hour long classes, Monday through Thursday. So um, you're welcome to join us and you're welcome to distribute this information um, to others. And um, I just thought I'd speak to a little bit to, um, you know, through these employee well-being services, we started to get many requests for departmental presentations. I think actually really UC Irvine started to learn more about what we were doing at the Samueli Institute. Um, you know, I, I, we, we were at UC Irvine, but you know, all departments are sort of doing their own thing. But I think because we started providing these services, you know, really all the departments started to realize what it is that we do. And many of them were inviting us out to speak um, at their departments. Um, I gave um, probably over 50 talks last year to different departments and then, um, you know, we also, that was really bringing people into our community classes that we offer. Um, but it also was really uh, triggering a lot of requests for us to do specific mindfulness courses to a department. So the department would call us and say, we want you to come out and do this for our employees. Um, and just some considerations I thought I'd mention if you're ever thinking about, you know, doing these kinds of classes. I mean, one thing that, you know, I do think it's important that people know that, I mean, I know there's a lot of burnout in the workplace right now. And I, I don't think mindfulness and yoga are the only things that fix that. <laughs> I, I think it's a gigantic uh, offering to help people with their own stress. But I also think that in, um, workplaces often are needing to look at kind of bigger things causing stress as well. Um, there's a, there's a, a book called The Burnout Epidemic. And I think it really addresses both sides of this, that there's things we can offer employees, but that shouldn't be the only thing we're doing. Um, and also if it's ever offered, really providing an introduction to it. I went to a workplace yesterday and gave a talk because they're going to be doing a program in their workplace. Sometimes beginning small, some people are ready to begin with a very big course, but considering some smaller offerings too and deciding whether virtual, in-person, or hybrid works best. I think that offering it on work time goes a long way. Um, sometimes considering a nominal participant fee, even if a department was going to pay for it. Um, there's times, you know, when people get things for free, they don't show up. So sometimes paying, having them pay a little bit can increase their engagement. But communicating definitely that these programs are voluntary um, and including an acknowledgement of risk because we, there are times that we maybe shouldn't be taking a mindfulness class. You know, um, I mean, there's so many things it can help with, but there's times where it might not be the right time, 
right? Maybe if um, someone, let's say, is suicidal, um, or if someone um, is newly like in a substance abuse program, it just might not be the best time. And so we have an acknowledgement of risk where we lay out kind of times that they might want to really consider if it's best and they can call and have a conversation with us to see the best next step. And also leading by example, right? When leadership is doing this as well as the employees. Okay, so um, kind of moving into our mindfulness-based stress reduction course, which is, you know, we have different instructors who offer it, but um, Nicole Riley is uh, offering our next one. Um, and she, um, this is virtual right now. Um, when our, our new building that I was showing in an earlier picture will be built, uh, will, is, is almost done. And so pretty soon we'll be doing MBSR in person, um, but it's still virtual. And um, these are the dates, July 9th through September 3rd, Saturdays, 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. And there's a retreat too, um, which is also online, but it's a six hour class. That's a very, um, often a very powerful class for people. Um, and I, Nicole is um, not only, you know, one of our instructors, she's a dear friend of mine. And I just thought I'd share a little bit about her. Um, you know, you can see she has her MD, which she was an anesthesiologist. Um, and I think realized that, uh, that that wasn't her life calling. And she went actually to Harvard to study religion, got into mindfulness, and then trained at UMass, where John Kabat-Zinn now has their uh, training program. Um, and she's just amazing. She also has her, her, um, her MA and her marriage family uh, therapy license. Um, she's amazing. And um, I joke that uh, she used to put people to sleep as an anesthesiologist and, and now she wakes people up with mindfulness because uh, I think mindfulness really is learning to stop sleepwalking through our lives and learning to wake up to all of these moments that we've actually been missing. And, um, you know, I think that these programs can really also provide a, a sense of community, a place to connect with one another when we're taking these classes together, processing through it together. Um, it can be a beautiful place to connect in these times of disconnection. And um, I just wanna thank you all for your time and also open it up to any questions or thoughts, dialogue in general. Oh, Tanya, you're on mute. Of course I am. <laughs> that was fabulous. I um, have a lot of questions and I'll let those um, put in Q and A or if they have them, but I wanted to ask you, um, what is like the biggest challenge that you're seeing in this space at the moment? Like mindfulness, is it acceptance? Like, what do you see when you're speaking to the corporations about this? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I think we're just, I know this might not be, <laughs> I think we're just working through what is, um, I'm not, I don't know that it's necessarily a challenge, but mm -hmm. like understanding the process of maybe how to open the door for people to, to have this. Um, I'm getting a little a message that says low system resources. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. It's fine. You can go on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I mean, one thing is to, I think, not only to like that people know that this is available and as an offering, but I think people need to know more than just it's an offering. I think they need to know about it, right? And so this company I was at yesterday, right? The um, owner of the company called and said she wants to provide a gift to her employees and bring mindfulness in for them to take this class. But I think we're just realizing, well, that can be offered, but uh, you know, people might be like, well, what is it? What, what am I signing up for? Um, and I think, um, I think just that there needs to be a process where people can get to learn about it. And like, not only the leadership, which of course is important, but also the employees where they can kind of hear something like, 
what I just shared with you now about what can this do for us? Why would we even want to take this so that they can then decide if it's something they want to do or not? Oh, I have another one if no one else has one. Um, I wanted to know, like if you're beginning this and you're thinking maybe you want to do some mindfulness, how do we see, like how do we identify like anger, grief, and anxiety within us so we can take that step? And I guess what I'm saying is you're walking through the day, yeah. maybe you're cranky or your whatever reactions are, and maybe how do we self-identify that is anger, that is anxiety? Yeah. There's something you can share to, to help with that? Sure. I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, when I taught in the schools um, in the in the uh, younger grades in the preschool and the kindergarten. Right. Do you remember those like the feeling charts that they would have up the like the emotion charts right that with the faces and not that we all actually we may all experience anger or or grief or sadness differently. Right. It's not that it's. Um, that there's one expression that we have. In fact, the research is showing that, that we, we might think we can detect someone else's feelings by their face, but a lot of times we're wrong because we are we experiencing experience it differently. Um, but I, I think we are just not um, encouraged to sit with difficult emotions, <laughs> right? And so we, we really, I mean, maybe the kindergartners are, right? But somehow we have moved away from that. And I think we like, turn we quickly turn away i i mean i'm saying we meaning in general i don't mean everyone there, i'm sure there's many people who don't but there's i think a tendency in our society to you know feel something and and pick up our phone right or um or numb ourselves in some way rather than feeling it and maybe i'll just even you know not i'm sure a lot of my life that's what i have been doing as well um and um anyway a little while ago something happened, I was proposing something in the workplace that was not going to happen. You know, my idea was basically not, not taking flight. So I felt rejected. Like I was like, that was what, what I was terming my, you know, experience emotionally. Like I'm feeling rejected right now by like, and, um, you know, it doesn't feel good. And I wanted to, you know, of course I didn't want to sit with that, but then I was like, Am I practicing what I preach? If I'm reading the guest house to all of you <laughs> and telling you to welcome each emotion, am I am I willing to sit with rejection? And honestly, like I I was even looking up, is there like meditation for rejection? There there was one. This was a while ago, but I was like, oh, um, and I literally, it's like I sat with it. Like I'm this is my guest house. And how does rejection feel for me? Like, what is it? Where am I noticing it in my chest? Like, and I feel tired. I feel like, you know, like teary, like I felt, and I'm like, I just like sat with it. Did it feel good? No. <laughs> like it, you know, was it, was it my favorite guest to have at my guest house? No. Am I glad I welcomed it into the guest, my guest house? Yeah. Because I got to, I was curious about it. So rather than being like, I want to get rid of you. I really just like sat with it, felt it. And um, it transformed, like it changed, it, it sat with me and then it left and then <laughs> that I could move on where I think if I hadn't done that, I, and so I think it's very, it's a very, each of our emotions are very personal to us. And it's, it's really starting with taking the time to, to feel them. Yeah. Um, and there's a book also that I came across recently called Permission to Feel written by, I think a professor, I believe at Yale, who really kind of talks about how these things called feelings, a lot of times we're just trying to push away, but that when we, their information for us, that feeling is like, a, can be a guide for us. Yeah. Wow. Let me, I can go on, but thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. This was absolutely amazing. I think Lindsay put it in there is so timely for mm -hmm. what you're going through right now. These are great. Yeah sources and now i am going to we're going to switch if you stop sharing and then lindsay's going to share and i'm just gonna give you a, a few little tidbits and and then and then we're good i guess now is the, the course which we just talked about um here's a really simple way to enroll bitly mbsr july 
uh, but it's also on the website. I will send you the link for that. And then we're having our book club is coming. It's starting again. And so we have one tomorrow. <clears throat> and I know I have something. Let's see. It's, yeah, Joshua Weiss, Dr. Joshua Weiss from the Harvard Negotiation Project. And he has a book, The Book of Real World Negotiations. He's going to be having amazing cases and discussing them. So that should be super interesting. Um, and the rest, I'll send you the links on for that. And, and then before I go on that, I was going to say, I'll send you with an email, the links, the information, books that Jessica mentioned, the flyer and the PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, let me see. And here is if you, if you have anything that you want us to go ahead and, and teach you about continuing education can do corporate training. We can be your second HR person, reach out to us and, and we'll be happy to, to help tell you how you can get 15% off and saying 15% off. That's the other thing. If you're a UCI employee, you will get 15% off. I will put that in the link as well um, if you register for the mindfulness class. And thanks a million, Jessica. This was phenomenal. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, it was really good. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. You'll be getting the recording soon. Take care.